So what happens after that? Okay, we've looked at the main sequence, we've looked at the red giant phase, then what happens depends on the mass of the star. So small stars like the Sun, as we discussed earlier on, they'll, they'll get rid of their outer layers, they'll, they'll fling off their outer layers in, into space, um, and what will be left is the core of the red giant. Very hot, about 15 million Kelvin maybe, um, and that will just sit there in space and cool and cool and cool until eventually it becomes what we call a black dwarf. Now, uh, the lifetimes of white dwarfs are kind of longer than the, the age of the universe, so there aren't many black dwarfs around at the moment, but there are lots of white dwarfs <coughs> which will eventually become black dwarfs. So that's not very dramatic. But if you have a big star, and we're talking about uh, greater than about three solar masses, all right, that, that symbol is the astronomical symbol for the sun there, the circle with a dot in the middle. So M, circle with a dot in the middle, means solar masses. So bigger than about three solar masses, uh, you, you, or the star experiences what's called a supernova explosion. Technically, it's a type 2 so supernova. And that means that the sun rips itself apart, um, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail in a minute. So for very big stars, um, and we're talking about between three but less than eight solar masses, roughly, um, what's left behind is what we call a neutron star. A pulsar is a type of neutron star, um, and neutron stars are rather strange objects, well, very strange objects with very peculiar properties, um, and that's where that star ends its life usually with a nebula around it, resulting from the supernova, and extremely big stars, so we're now talking about more than eight solar masses, um, you end up with a black hole, which is an extreme object, which we'll talk about at the end of this video. So, for small stars, uh, as we've stopped, uh, as we've said, fusion stops, okay, um, high, high, helium fusion, that is, mainly, um, and the outer layers, the outer areas, the outer envelope of gas is ejected to form what we call a planetary nebula. And here's a couple of pictures of planetary nebula, nebulae. Um, so the, this, these, these big colorful rings are um, the hydrogen envelope of the old star. And in the middle there, you can see the white dwarf there. Okay, It's not fusing, it's what we call inert. Um, but it's it's still emitting lots of radiation, so it's a very very bright object, um, and that's the one there from this nebula. Nebulae are very beautiful, so if you get a chance to look at, look them up, then please do so. In the core of um, the red giant, which is now the white dwarf for a small star, um, the atoms are squeezed so close together. So we're talking about carbon, oxygen, maybe some helium all squashed, squashed, squashed by gravity, so close together that the atoms are pushed and forced right up against each other. Uh, the electrons in those atoms fall down into their lowest energy levels, their lowest quantum states, because there actually isn't any space for them to, to move around. Um, and they start to push against each other. And as the electrons push against each other, we call that electron degeneracy pressure. There's a funny word, degeneracy. We say that the electrons have become degenerate as they've fallen down into their lowest energy state um, and been packed together. So that electron degeneracy pressure pushes outwards or pushes, you know, against the neighboring atoms, which forms a sort of solid type um, um, object, I suppose. Um, uh, which means that it can't be compressed. You know, you can't squeeze atoms into each other uh, because of the, you know, the, the repulsion from the electrons. So that's what holds up a white dwarf. That's what prevents the gravitational collapse. Okay. So um, maximum mass of a white dwarf is about 1.4 solar masses. All right. So that's as large as they can get. Beyond that, something else happens. We end up with a neutron star. Uh, now, 1.4 solar masses is about 2.8 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. And the radius is around about the same as that of the Earth. So you've got 1.4 suns squeezed into a radius of about the same as the Earth. So, you know, that's, that's pretty dense. So what is the density? Okay, so let's have a look at that. We'll just do this little sum here. Density is equal to mass over volume. 
So we've got the mass given at the top there. So we've got 2.8 oops, sorry, times 10 to the 30 kilograms divided by the volume. Now the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So we've got 4 thirds times pi times r. Now the radius is 6,000 kilometers. So that's 6 times 10 to the 6 meters. So times 10 to the 6 meters cubed. All right, so we've got mass of the volume. And that equals, um, if you do the numbers, 3.1 times 10 to the 9 kilograms, meters, kilograms per meters cubed. OK, so 3.1, sorry about the, the joining up together. The, uh, the software seems to, to like doing that. Um, just rub that out so that's clearer for you there. And there. There we go. Oops, that's an equal sign. OK, all right, so that's quite dense. 3.1 times 10 to the 9 kilograms per cubic meter. So a cubic meter of white dwarf material will have a mass of about 3 billion kilograms, which is... You know, reasonably dense. So now we're talking about um, larger stars. Uh, so between three and eight solar masses, um, which I'm calling here a medium mass star, but it's actually quite a, lar a large star. Um, what happens then is the star will form um, a neutron star at the point when it goes supernova. So fusion stops. Um, now we're talking about fusion of larger elements. Uh, which may be, as I say, up to iron, um, and it just switches off immediately. And when that happens, the core collapses very, very rapidly. Um, you know, within within a second or so, um, it goes from being a normal-sized star uh, right down on itself to until it is around about 10 kilometers in diameter. So it's about the size of a city. So if you can imagine. Um, 1.8 solar masses, so nearly twice the mass of the sun, collapsing down within a second until it's the size of a city, and you've kind of got the idea of what's happening. It's also extremely hot and full of, uh, you know, lots of different elements in this plasma. Now, at some point during that rapid collapse, it passes the point of electron degeneracy. So the gravity has got such a strong grip on it that it squashes it and squashes it and squashes it and it pushes the electrons towards each other and then it pushes the electrons in towards the protons and neutrons in the center of the nuclei, uh, you know, in the center of the atoms there. Um, it pushes them in so hard that the protons and the electrons run out of room. And what happens is they effectively, I mean, you, I'm using this term fuse lightly, it's not the same as nuclear fusion, but they join together in what we call inverse beta decay. So the proton will actually join with the electron to produce a neutron uh, and a neutrino as well. All right, because they don't have any room to coexist, they um, they're pushed in together and they fuse together to become um, a neutron, which is why it's called a neutron star. Um, and once the neutrons all start to get pushed together, that that causes an even larger force, uh, which we call neutron degeneracy pressure. Um, so the neutrons become degenerate. Um, they have no more space, they run out of room, and they push up against each other, um, causing another outward pressure called neutron degeneracy pressure, um, and that causes another outward force that halts the collapse. So now we've had uh, the matter in the star crushed down to about 10 kilometers. The protons and the electrons in the atoms have been pushed in together to form neutrons, and those neutrons pushing against each other have finally stopped this enormous gravitational force that's trying to squash the star. Um, and all that's happened within a second or so. Now, the neutron star is an extremely strange object. Um, and I've got that, this is an artist's interpretation here. I mean, in actual fact, I think this one here is, is um, yeah, this is called the Crab Nebula, um, which was discovered by the Chinese in the 11th century. It looks like a crab shell. Right at the centre there is um, is a neutron star. You can't see it very well in this picture, but it's somewhere in the middle there. Um, it's also what we call a pulsar. Um, and here is an artist's interpretation of a pulsar. When the core collapses, 
its spin rate, just like um, a, you know, an ice dancer when she pulls her arms in, the spin rate will increase dramatically. And so these things are spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning really, really rapidly. And we're talking, in some cases, milliseconds. So, um, you know, they will spin in less than a second, possibly even a thousandth of a second to, uh, to, to, for one rotation. So, in addition, the magnetic fields of, of the um, neutron star become extremely large, and, and that pushes beams of charged particles away from the magnetic poles. You can see the magnetic field lines in that sort of configuration. It pushes beams of, of charged particles away and lots of radiation, uh, you know, lots of gamma rays and x-rays and things like that, and also radio frequencies. Um, and that becomes um, like a spinning beam, a rotating beam of, of energy. Um, if that crosses your field of view, then you will get a, a radio pulse, you know, a few times a second. And that's what we call a pulsar. And pulsars were first discovered in uh, in the 1960s, 1970s, something like that. Okay, so that's that's that. That's 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 neutron stars. Um, what neutron stars are made of, we don't really know. Uh, we know there are lots of, or we think we know that there are lots of neutrons in them. Um, and here's a sort of almost a speculation uh, in terms of what what is in them. So we've got here. Um, something that we really don't understand. Uh, densities in the region of 10 to the 15 uh, grams per cubic centimeter, so that's about 10 to the 18 kilograms per cubic meter. Um, here we've got neutrons, superfluid protons, possibly degenerate electrons. Here we've got some sort of crust with uh, lattice-like nuclei, you know, pushing against each other, forming a lattice. Uh, maybe superfluid neutrons, no idea. Maybe neutrons drip inwards from the outer surface. Um, you know, don't really know. Here's another one. Uh, this, I love this. The way the nuclei are clustered together, you've got the meatballs phase, the spaghetti phase, the lasagna phase, and the Swiss cheese phase, and then we don't really know what happens beyond that. So, uh, you know, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of sort of intelligent speculation about what, what might go on within within a neutron star. So, what's the gravitational field like? You know, how how strong would would gravity be? Um, so, here's a question: What would be the gravitational field strength on the surface of a two solar mass neutron star of radius 10 kilometers? So, the gravitational field strength. In this case, we need the equation g m over r squared. Okay, so we've got Newton's gravitational constant times the mass of the star, which is two solar masses divided by r squared, r being 10 kilometers, so it's obviously 10 to the 10 times 10 to the 3 meters. Um, now when you put all the numbers in, into that, and for, for uh, speed sake I'll, I'll, I'll miss that step out, um, but you end up with a value of about 6.7 times 10 to the 8 newtons per kilogram, or meters per second squared. All right, so 6.7 times 10 to the 8 newtons per kilogram. Now, bearing in mind that the gravitational field strength on the Earth is 9.81, you know, you've got an extremely large um, gravitational field. And actually, if you could jump off a of one, if you could get onto it, if you jumped off a of one-story building uh, on the surface of a neutron star, you'd hit the surface of a neutron star with a speed of approximately um, a million meters per second or something ridiculous like that. Um, so massive, massive gravitational field strengths. Okay, so the supernova. Um, so formation of the neutron star takes less than a second. It just goes bang like that in on itself. Um, and that creates an instability which causes the outer layers of the, um, the red giant, which it still is at this point, uh, to fall inward at supersonic velocities, approaching relativistic velocities, here we've got 50,000 kilometers per second. So, you know, that these, these nuclei, atoms, and everything is, are just piling in on, on the, the newly formed surface of the neutron star. They hit that neutron star at high velocity and rebound off. So that rips the star apart um, in, in this, this supernova. Okay, so you have this enormous implosion followed by explosion that rips the star apart. And during that process, there's enough energy to fuse all the elements greater or heavier than, than iron. 
So, um, you know, the gold and the uranium and all that sort of stuff is formed during that supernova. So the, uh, the whole of the periodic table is now complete, all the naturally occurring elements anyway, during that supernova. Okay, there are lots of videos of uh, simulations of supernova on, on YouTube, which I'm sure you can take a look at. All right, so part three for very large stars, and we're talking about greater than eight solar masses. Um, these stars undergo the same process. They have a supernova, but even that neutron degeneracy pressure, even the pressure of those neutrons pushing out against each other in that sort of giant atomic nucleus in the sky uh, is not enough to halt the gravitational collapse. And at present, we don't really know what happens after that. You know, there are theorized objects of what we call um, quark stars, uh, which I'm not going to go into here, um, but we don't know anything that can halt the collapse. It just keeps on going. It keeps collapsing. So you've got about two and a half solar masses of matter collapsing in on itself and never stopping. So effectively, gravity has finally won the game. Uh, and over the star and, and nothing can hold it up at this point here and when that happens what you end up with is a black hole now here's a sort of artist interpretation of a black hole the bit at the middle is the black bit but that's not the same as the actual matter in the middle the matter in the middle is extremely extremely small possibly infinitely small it may actually have no dimensions um, and we call it a singularity now physicists and mathematicians don't like the idea of uh, a singularity it doesn't fit with their equations, um, but potentially that's what a black hole could be, um, and therefore it has an extremely high, possibly infinite density. I mean, if you imagine the ball in a ballpoint pen, the one right at the tip that you actually write with, that tiny little ball in there, and you imagine three or four suns squeezed into that little tiny space there, that's the sort of thing that we're talking about, and then it just keeps on collapsing. So we've got extremely high masses possibly up to 100 solar masses, extremely high density, possibly infinite density, extremely small, zero size, very, very rapid rotation and extremely large magnetic fields, and you've got a very weird object. But the thing that most people remember about, about black holes is that the escape velocity, i.e. how fast you'd have to be going to actually get away from it gravitationally, is actually greater than the speed, the speed of light. Sorry, that should say the speed of light there. So not even light can escape. And that's where the black bit comes in, because obviously if, if no light is getting out, then no radiation is escaping, and you're not going to be able to see anything. Um, and so the edge of the black area there, which I've put in the diagram down here, is called the event horizon. And that's where the black area uh, begins. So inside that radius there, um, which is called the Schwarzschild radius, there is nothing. Well, they say there is nothing. There, the, no light is escaping. And in the middle there, that little red dot there, is the singularity. So that's where all the matter is, um, is collected and still shrinking, still collapsing under its own gravity. Just outside the event horizon here, we've got what they call the photon sphere. Um, now obviously photons that are coming in, so light that's coming in, if it just misses the photon sphere like that, it can, co it can go travel in a curved path um, around one of the uh, sort of gravitational contour lines, if you like. Um, and escape. But if it if it's within the photosphere, it basically goes in a circle all the way around the black hole. So if you were stood here uh, looking down this way towards this green arrow, a photon that left the back of your head, i.e. light that left the back of your head, could travel all the way around the photon sphere and hit you in the face. So you would actually be able to see the back of your head, which is an extreme, extremely strange sensation. Um, yeah, so that's the photon sphere, and then you've got the event horizon, which is the limit of normal space beyond which the escape velocity becomes greater than light, and then you've got this singularity um, at the center. So that's black holes. They're extremely weird. They're called black holes because they make a hole in space-time, you know, a big well in space-time. They stretch space-time so much that it has no limit to that stretching. Okay, so there we go. That's black holes. Um, there's lots more on YouTube, so please feel free to explore it.